I'm here with Alexander Mercurius, Editor-in-Chief of the Duran. Alexander, we have been covering the Duma chemical weapons hoax from the very beginning. Um, even before we had the channel up and running, we were writing articles for the Duran.com. We were posting articles which recognized that this was a hoax from the get-go. Um, since then, and since we've had this channel, we've done multiple videos where we've outlined in detail that what happened in Duma was a hoax. The most recent ones revolved around some of the leaks out of the OPCW via WikiLeaks, which showed that there were many people working at the OPCW who had their information that revealed it was a hoax suppressed by their superiors. And you had the privilege of attending an event in London, the House of Commons presentation of OPCW leaks at Duma, and you have some very interesting information that you would like to share with our viewers with relations to the OPCW and the Duma chemical weapons hoax that happened in Syria. So, Alexander, it's, the floor is yours. Yes, indeed. And I have to say, I was hugely privileged to be at this event. And it was enormously interesting and very fascinating and extremely disturbing at the same time. And as you rightly said, it took place um, in the House of Commons in the Thatcher Room at Port Cullis House. And uh, there was an extraordinarily Im impressive lineup of people who were speaking. Now, it was chaired by Je Major General John Holmes, who is a, a former uh, a commanding officer, a former officer, a senior officer in the British Royal Marines and a special forces uh, officer. But amongst the speakers was were Dr. Piers Robinson, who is the co-director of the Organization for Propaganda Studies and convener of the Working Group on Syria Propaganda and Media. Then there was also Professor David Miller, who is a professor of political sociology at the University of Bristol. And um, there was also a very impressive presentation, detailed presentation by Professor Paul McKeague, who is professor of epidemiology at the University of Edinburgh. And also a very important presentation by Jonathan Steele, who is now an independent journalist, but who was for many years the chief foreign correspondent for The Guardian. Now, this presentation took place directly after a session in New York of the United Nations Security Council. This was an informal session which heard from one of the OPCW inspectors who went to Duma, um, Ian Henderson, who was the inspector who drafted the engineering report about the uh, uh, supposed canisters that supposedly contained the chlorine gas, which had supposedly been at the heart of this incident in Duma. And um, this was obviously touched upon at the uh, uh, meeting that I went and the way in which um, Ian Henderson explained about how concerned he was that the OPCW had suppressed his report and about how other, other uh, inspectors were also concerned about how their report was, uh, their, their, their findings were suppressed. Now, can I also say that we should fairly soon have a detailed written account of this meeting which is in the process of being agreed, the, the, the meeting which I attended, and it will be uh, appearing soon on our website, so that if you want to know exactly what was said there, um, or you, you can actually go to that report, and that will give you a, 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 an accurate record. Now, can I take, can tell you my you know, major takeaways from it? Because as I said, I found it profoundly shocking. Can I, can I first of all deal with, uh, um, uh, Dr. Uh, Professor McKeague's evidence, which I, in some ways was the most, I thought, the most disturbing of all, uh, which is that um, it's quite clear that the um, position, the, the canisters which fell, actually, this is both uh, uh, Professor Professor Miller and Professor McKeague. We're talking about the canisters. There's two canisters that are supposed to have been the cause of the entire problem. They both went into the ballistics, the, the details of how <laughs> canisters, the canisters are supposed to have fallen. One of them, you know, finding its way onto a bed. The bed is intact. The canisters are intact. 
they explained in great detail how the actual inspectors who went to Duma looked at these canisters, examined the areas around the buildings, everything, and concluded that it was impossible for those canisters to have fallen in the way that was being alleged. Why is it impossible? I mean, you know, technically, it just could, they couldn't find any mechanism whereby such a thing could have happened naturally. So that can only leave the solution for the position of the canisters being where it was that they were manually placed there. And um, we were also shown photographs of the canisters, and there was clear evidence that uh, um, during the period of time, just before the canisters were inspected, even after the first photographs were taken, but before the inspectors arrived, there were manipulations of the scene. One of the canisters was turned over, turned upside down, or turned over to make it seem more plausible that it had fallen in the way that was being alleged. But you actually had clear manipulation of the crime, the crime scene. And even more remarkable, as I said, was the was the evidence, the evidence about the um, injuries, because um, what um, happened was that in one of these buildings where there were these canisters, what I hadn't realized is that the corridors of these buildings and the stairwell were filled with dead bodies. Now, these dead bodies are supposed to be the victims of this chemical attack. But it seems that there was no actual um, autopsies done on these bodies. So it's not clear what kind of, what caused these people to die. Um, but a number of things were explained to us. Firstly, that it is impossible that so many people could have died. As about 30, we're talking about around 30 to 40 people. So many people could have died so quickly in such a short time from chlorine. The amount of chlorine you would need to kill people in that number, at that speed, is many, many multiples, the amount of chlorine that those two canisters could have contained. That is the first thing. The second thing is the positioning of those bodies is inconsistent with people being dying from chlorine. Um, if, if chlorine gas is falling, apparently people try to run away and escape from it. They don't just fall over and die like the in the way that they are that they were appeared to have died in this building. So in that is also inconsistent with those bodies having died, uh, those people having died in that kind of a way. But you know, the most damning thing for me and in some ways the most troubling it, it is that the inspectors the people who went there uh, and other people researchers who've looked at this they said that the symptoms of these people the sort of frothing that that was seen around their mouths and things of this kind are simply inconsistent with chlorine poisoning at least chlorine poisoning on the scale that is alleged it would be consistent with sarin poisoning might be consistent with sarin poisoning but it is not consistent with chlorine poisoning and this does two things this this, this opens up two things firstly uh, this combination of evidence shows that it couldn't have been chlorine that killed these people. But secondly, we know from the inspectors who went to the scene that there was no actual traces of sarin in the environment. So that begs the question of how did these people die? Now, we have no actual evidence. There's no actual information about how they died because the the investigation is incomplete but one possibility and it does seem to be the most plausible one is that they must have been taken to a chamber and gassed with sarin that seems to be the most logical thing 
And after they were killed in that way, their bodies were removed from the chamber and placed where they were in order to stage what looks like it was intended to be a sarin attack. Now, that is a pretty monstrous con you know, conclusion. I mean, as several people pointed out, if that is true, uh, and as I said, it's the only um, it's the only um, result that seems to be consistent with the known facts. Then we're talking about an extremely serious war crime having been committed in Duma by whoever it was who was trying to stage this uh, uh, this incident and make it look like a sarin attack. The, the moderate rebels, the white well, helmets, the, well, the white, Al Qaeda, well, Al Nusra. I mean, you, yes. Tell us who, yeah. in yes, your, I mean, in your that, analysis, that, that, that who were the exactly people what, that stages? That because exactly what, yeah. I remember many videos by yeah. the White Helmets, which showed the White Helmets training yeah. by moving bodies around. Yes. Everyone, everyone that's viewing this video right now, I'm sure I've seen these videos on the web yeah. that came out about a year, yeah. year and a half ago, where the White Helmets are running drills, where they're carrying bodies, moving them around. The scenario yeah. that you're describing, which is a huge bombshell mm. scenario, Yes. Runs consistent with much of the training videos that we saw of the White Helmets, who we also know were deeply yes. embedded with Al Qaeda and Al Nusra. They were one and the same, pretty much. Yes. So, I mean, well, well who, who are these say, people that planted suffice, this evidence? Well, that, suffice, suffice to say, the area, Duma, was under the control of a violent jihadi militant group called Jaish al Islam which is ideologically connected to al-Nusra, which is ideologically part of al-Qaeda. So, you know, that, that connects that group. And they must have been involved at some level. And the White Helmets were also there. And it was the White Helmets or elements within the White Helmets that were reporting that there was a chemical attack in Duma. The Oscar so, you know, award-winning White Helmets, you know, the Oscar award-winning well, White Helmets, well, the well, Netflix indeed. documentary White Helmets. White Helmets. Now, can, you, can I just say, I mean, these are these are suppositions. We're joining up the dots. There has to be, a, there, there ought to be a proper criminal investigation to find out exactly what did happen. But, you know, I, I'm going to put, say it simply, they must be, they must be, important suspects prime suspects if you like i say no more than that anyway so that 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 was you know that that shocked a lot of people in the audience and i will say there were mps in the audience members of parliament one of them asked uh, um, a question a very very searching question um and um you know uh, and so, you know, they, they are now aware of this. And when this report gets circulated, the one I'm talking about, people will be able to read in that report all the scientific evidence that's laid out there uh, in much more detail and far more thoroughly and much more, uh, you know, with, by, by the actual experts than I can do. Because, of course, I repeat, I'm not a scientist. Can anyway, I summarize it one more time just to make sure yeah. I understand what you yes what you heard at this event, Alexander. Yeah. In other words, the White Helmets, Al-Nusra, Al-Qaeda, Al all these groups who at the time were controlling Duma. Yes. Is that correct? They yes. were at the time controlling yes. Duma. They were controlling Duma. Most likely. Yes. Most likely took canisters that supposedly were filled with chlorine. They placed them. Yes two canisters they place them in these positions and we've seen photos as well of the of the canister on the bed that's a pretty yeah. well known photo of that canister yeah. that sits there on the yeah. bed yes they place them there so they planted that evidence and then somewhere in the past they had gassed people yeah with sarin yeah. and moved those bodies and planted them in a position as well to to stage this entire duma hoax which almost led to a direct war between the United States and Syria, i.e., Russia, as well. Is that is this correct? What I've that, just summarized. That is the essence of it. But I must make two particular qualifications. Firstly, it's not clear to me that there was any actual 
uh, 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 chlorine in the canisters, and presumably the intention anyway right. was to make out that those canisters had, you know, was carrying sarin rather than chlorine. That's the first thing to say. The other thing is that I heard quite a lot of evidence about the fact that those bodies, the the people who were dead there, were killed very very short time before their bodies were placed where they were and they, there's there's there was there's apparently um good ways of assessing how recently those people were killed and in fact it would have been within a few hours so this whole thing was staged if it was staged which it seems it must have been at extraordinary speed a lot of things you know the 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 it wasn't really tied up or sorted out properly and of course, before the uh, staging was complete, the, the Jaish al Islam pulled out. The place was flooded with the Syrian army and Russian military police. And uh, there were references to the important role the Russian military police played in securing the crime scene. So they were the, the people who were staging this incident weren't able to complete the staging in the way that they had intended so in it, 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 but it all extremely disturbing now so that's the incident itself there there were also a lot of things that then became clear about the opcw investigation now it seems what happened is that the that there was a long explanation um, in response to a question i asked by the way about the how the um convention for chemical weapons is you know, works and how the OP OPCW is supposed to carry out investigations. And it turned out that the OPCW has already, even before Duma, made massive changes, uh, uh, you know, bad changes, I should say, to the way in which investigations are supposed to be carried out. And we now have this, uh, 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 you know, a special group, the FFM, as it's called, which is supposed to go and carry out the on the spot investigation which is a somewhat variant from the way it should be done as set out in the convention. But never mind. These people were then, you know, the inspectors, the FFM by the OPCW were sent to Duma and they carried out their researches there. Um, and the, 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 these people then started to report back to OPCW headquarters their findings that they couldn't find any trace of sarin that there wasn't anywhere near enough chlorine around in fact there was a lot of controversy about the chlorine because the chlorine traces were very small and the opcw inspectors who went to duma were very unhappy about the fact that even the uh, even the opcw's interim report mentioned chlorine at all because they were basically just you know normal trace elements such as you'd find in an urban setting. Anyway, these people were reporting back no evidence, you know, that there was actually a chemical attack, but we do have clear evidence that there was staging, you know, the positioning of the canisters. And there were all these very disturbing reports about these dead bodies. Now, can I say the inspectors did not say these dead bodies had been murdered and this whole thing had been fabricated in that way. These are deductions that other people have made looking at the evidence that the inspectors were finding. But before the inspectors were able to complete their investigations, they were then basically taken off the entire investigation. An entirely new group of people were uh, appointed to draw up the final report, the final OPCW report. This new group of people never went to Duma. They carried out all their work from a country that is referred to in uh, as country X, but which everybody apparently knows is Turkey. And they base their evidence or they base their findings on you won't be surprised when I tell you information that was given to them by witnesses, the witnesses being the white helmets and the people that the white helmets found. And that was the that it was it was the findings of the second group that never went to Duma that are, in fact, what you basically see 
in the OPCW finding re uh, final report. So the people who were actually in Duma are incredibly unhappy. They've been, um, most of them are, wait a minute, all of them are staunchly loyal to the OPCW and to the convention. They're not people who are in any way, you know, difficult people, aggrieved people. They just feel that their work has not been acknowledged, that it's not been reported properly, and that the findings, the findings in the final report, the, the one that the OPCW has published, are simply incompatible with what they themselves found when they went to Duma. Now, I'm going to make one quick observation. I know there's all sorts of people, uh, Bellingcat, of course, is one, that is criticizing some of the uh, work of these inspectors. It's saying, you know, that they made mistakes, that they didn't understand what was going on and all this sort of thing. Firstly, just look at the qualifications of these people. Now, we don't know who all of these people are. They've not been, you know, individually named and identified. But they were people entrusted by the OPCW to go to Duma. And we know about one of them, who is Ian Henderson, who came to the UN Security Council, and he is beyond any doubt whatsoever a highly qualified person in this field. So they had that technical expertise to make a proper assessment of the crime scene. And they visited the crime scene. They were actually there. They were able to do the forensic tests on the crime scene. All of these people, Bellingcat, Brian Whitaker, all of these people who are criticizing them. Firstly, I don't think they have remotely the kind of qualifications, the kind of technical qualifications that these people have. But over and above and beyond that, though those inspectors went to the crime scene, their critics did not. And that, it seems to me, is an absolutely critical and fundamental difference. So I, I've tried to summarise what I heard at this meeting. I, I want to touch on what Jonathan Steele said um, quickly also. But, you know, before I get on to Jonathan Steele, I should say that is the technical evidence that I heard. It's extremely disturbing. And for those who say it is inconceivable that, you know, 30 to 40 people could have been brutally murdered in a, such a way as to stage an incident like this, Major General Holmes, who is an uh, um, experienced military officer who has been in combat and who knows the face of war, pointed out that in civil wars, and of course, the Syrian war is not just a civil war, but a ferocious sectarian war involving groups like ISIS and Al Qaeda. Such things are entirely possible. Before you get on to Steele, Alexander, the, cr the critics are also not funded. The critics are funded, sorry, by groups like the Atlantic Council, NATO, neocons, no. etc. So. Whatever, well, whenever they criticize people like Henderson, everyone should know that these groups get their funding from the warmonger elitist globalist class. Anyway, that's, ab that's absolutely true, and I think it's I think it repays saying. I mean, the critics are self interested critics. I mean, they have a financial interest, but of course, they're also he heavily invested. They've that many of them have built up reputations now around the view there, you know, the interpretation of the Syrian war that they have been peddling now for several years. So we have to bear all that in mind. Whereas these inspectors, these inspectors who went to Duma, who carried out an on-the-spot inspection of the crime scene, are genuine independent people. Now, Jonathan Steele, now, Jonathan Steele, uh, for those who don't know him, is an absolute legend in British journalism. Um, he was, for many years, in my opinion, the, the finest foreign correspondent that uh, uh, was in, in, in the British media. He, he covered 
the crisis in the Soviet Union, which led to the Soviet Union's collapse, and he did it superbly. This is one of the most experienced journalists um, around. Now, he was um, contacted and has provided an explanation of how he was contacted and he eventually, you know, by people who were telling him there's all these all this information coming out of the OPCW. And he went to Brussels and he heard this uh, apparently masterly presentation that was made by one of the OPCW inspectors who went to Duma and it, you know, provided, you know, it was PowerPoints and all kind and internal emails, and all sorts of things that explained exactly what went wrong and how it went wrong. Um, and, you know, Jonathan Steele was profoundly shocked by it all and wanted to write a story about this. And of course, initially he turned to The Guardian, which is his former newspaper, and he found that he couldn't get it published there. And he went to all sorts of other places and he was told things, you know, you know, we can't publish this because it it's either Russian propaganda or it conforms with Russian interests. And he said, you know, he's saying, well, even if it conforms with Russian interests and can, Russian narratives, the fact is, if what these inspectors are saying is true, the fact that it might be conforming with Russian interests is not a reason not to publish it. Now, that is ethical journalism. That's the point he was making. And yet he came up against this wall of refusal. And I would add, by the way, uh, um, I, I understand that several people again uh, uh, said, you know, well, Bellingcat is insisting on a different narrative. I mean, one of the very, very uh, troubling things about this is that um, th this extraordinary authority that Bellingcat seems to have, which enables it basically to ensure that people's, people who attempt to question the, if you like, the official narrative, don't get hurt, which seems to be extraordinary, given that Bellingcat is ultimately only an opinion uh, body. I mean, they're all, all, all that they can ever report is their own opinions. And again, I reiterate, they didn't go to Duma. So they weren't, on, they weren't there. They weren't on the crime scene. They aren't reporting. They can't, their reporting cannot, by definition, have the kind of authority that a team of professional trained inspectors has, which actually went to Duma. It's a, it's a vital point people consistently overlook. Anyway, eventually, after a great deal of trouble, Jonathan Steele found one outlet that published him, and that was Counterpunch. And you can find his story there. And after Counterpunch published it, it was circulated to a certain extent. Um, largely though amongst alternative news sites in britain only only three mainstream journalists have reported the story one is jonathan Steele himself obviously and he's been able to talk about it on in places like the bbc um, another is robert fisk who is one of the leading journalists on the middle east and who's written a very very powerful piece about it um, in the independent but the absolute runaway also, stuff also went to the site by the way it also went to the site indeed uh, uh, and in fact even before the inspectors he was actually there and he actually spoke to witnesses who also told him there was no chemical attack but you know apart from, and and the third who is in fact the absolute star is peter hitchens in the daily mail who has covered the story brilliantly and is now becoming extremely concerned about the way in which this story is not being published or covered properly by the rest of the media and in fact peter hitchens has recently written as has ambassador craig murray by the way that um it, it makes one wonder whether if there was an iraq war if the iraq war had happened now the fact that no weapons of mass destru destruction were found in iraq would ever have been uh, uh, published we'd ever know about it in the mainstream media because um, the degree of control of this story is so extraordinary. I, I'm going to make a comment here, by the way. In Britain, the degree of silence is so extreme that I personally think 
that there has been a direct order made from Whitehall, from the civil service, saying that you you know this the the the, the media mustn't cover this story for some reason. That that's my own view because I, I can't believe that editors, you know, would be so monolithic that even 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 you know sort of uh, uh, tabloid newspapers wouldn't be publishing. So some reason, what reason? Well, because the way in which the British government is able to communicate to newspapers, this is consistent with that. It, it, we have this uh, D-notice system in Britain um, in which uh, the, the British government is able to alert newspapers and say to them, there's, an, there's a story that impinges on national policy and you know we don't want you to cover what, it. What national policy though? What's the reason? That, well, the, that the UK is supporting Al-Qaeda? Well, is that the reason? I mean, I'm well, asking. I don't, I, I, don't, I don't know. I don't know what reason they are giving, and I'm not here to protect the British government. All I am saying is that I don't believe that such a blanket wall of media silence would be possible without a direct order from Whitehall. I might be wrong about that, but that's my view. Why would the British government not want the truth to come out well i i will give a re i will give a reason and i i think this is probably the right one that the british government joined in the missile attack directly after the duma incident and before the investigation took place in fact i actually made i actually posed a question to the panel in which I said, and it, it, you know, um, it, it met with universal agreement. Nobody actually said anything, but after the meeting, various people came up to me and said uh, um, that, um, you know, commented about my. It wasn't a question; it was a point, and you know how right it was. In which I said, point I've made many times, that you know, if you act in that way, if you launch a missile strike on a country based on what you say is classified intelligence, classified intelligence being almost by definition incomplete, then you are putting, you're prejudicing any future investigation by putting enormous pressure on the investigators. Theresa May did this over the Skripal attack in Salisbury when she stood up in the House of Commons and said before the police investigation had got underway properly that it was the Russians who did it. And she did this in she did this over the Duma incident also. So if it turns out that there was no chemical attack in Duma and this incident was entirely staged, which I have to say, based on everything I heard at this meeting, must be the case. I mean, I can't really see any other explanation. Then, of course, Theresa May launched a missile attack on another country on basis of false information, said untrue things to the British people to justify that attack. And of course, launching an attack on another country is aggression if it's done without proper course which is a war crime because Theresa may wanted to prop up the, the moderate rebels yeah well, absolutely al-qaeda yeah. al-nusra to overthrow absolutely. the assad government i well, mean at the well, end of the well, day obviously. that was her agenda above well, and beyond everything else well obviously yes but if you want me to you know give a reason why the british government is so sensitive about this and is keeping this story out of the media as i think it is I, mean, I don't know this for a fact. I mean, you know, nobody in Whitehall tells me whether there's a denosis out or not. But if the, uh, that, I think, is the reason why uh, um, they would be doing it, if they are doing it. Well, this is a huge story that no one's reporting in the U.S. either. I don't know. Uh, some of our viewers in other countries as well, Canada, yeah. Australia, wherever you're located. Yes. I doubt this, this story is getting much traction anywhere. Well, indeed. Well, I come back to what Peter Hitchens says. If if Iraq happened now, would we be reading in our media or hearing in our media that no weapons of mass destruction were found there? Craig Murray has said the same thing. In fact, in in tr in, tr in fairness, I think it was Craig Murray who said it first. All right. Any other closing comments, Alexander? Yes, on, yes, on what one, I think is one, astonishing. One, 
account one very, of what happened. One very, one very uh, uh, brief one, which is the Tariq Haddad, who was the Newsweek journalist who tried to uh, publish the story at Newsweek and who resigned uh, and was basically forced out because he tried to cover it. He was also at this meeting. Uh, uh, we exchanged words. He, we had m much to tell me. Um, and I, I salute a brave man. What was the like? Well, I mean, he suffered. He, the context. He's, he's, he's career basically. He's journalist. Because he wanted to publish a story. He wanted to publish a story in but Newsweek. Yeah, in Newsweek, but again, as 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 a proper ethical journalist, he he felt that he had to cover it. And um, bear in mind that he's from Georgia, so he knows Syria. Which of course people in Newsweek don't know Syria. He understands the situation in G in Syria very well. So you know that would have already made him suspicious, I think, of many of the elements of the story. So um, by the way, he, just to make clear, he's a Jordanian. He is not a Palestinian. He made that very clear to me, and there is a distinction. So he knows Syria well, and he wanted to publish this story. He was very he's very concerned about the way in which the public are being misinformed. Um, he was basically forced off Newsweek. He's been subjected to all kinds of attacks. And um, it's going to be very difficult for him from now on. But you know, I just wanted to say that he has our support in what he's done. I really wish this account that you've given Alexander finds its way to people like Tucker Carlson. Well, I hope so. That's the only that's the only name I can think of at this moment in time in the mainstream media that would dare to report on what you have just told all our viewers. And can I also remind our viewers that we will very shortly be publishing the actual written record of what was said at this meeting. And it didn't happen, you know, in some little hall somewhere in, you know, uh, uh, provincial England. It happened in the premises of the House of Commons. Fort Hollis. Who Fort in the Hollis. UK mainstream media would uh, report on this, in your opinion? Well, the one person who is reporting on it is Peter Hitchens, and he's not an insignificant voice. Robert Fisk also. And anyone else Patrick, that comes to mind? Uh, pa Patrick Coburn, possibly. Apart from those three, no one. No one. All right. But Patrick Coburn tends to focus on Iraq. Robert Fisk is the person who deals with Syria, and he's covered it well. Okay, I think one American network also covered it well in the United yeah. States. They're uh, yeah. they're gaining traction as a channel, as a cable channel, but yeah. they're much smaller than the Fox News. Yes, yes. MSNBC, CNN. Well, they may, they may be bigger than CNN at this point. <laughs> Who knows? Well, quite possibly. Uh, well, yeah. quite quite possibly. Well, I, I hope I provided people with a clear summary, my own understanding of what was said there. All I will say is, I left that meeting profoundly shocked by what I heard. No, it's absolutely shocking what you've uh, just told us. Absolutely shocking. I mean, we knew it was a hoax. We've reported that it was a hoax. Yes. But yes. to this extent and to this just evil. Yes, yes. Just evil. Yeah, well, indeed. All these can guys. I, can I just say what I think ought to be done? I think inspectors should be sent back to Duma. And they should try and find those bodies of those people who died, because this is the extraordinary thing. There was never any proper autopsy done. I believe even on purpose. After, well, of course not. Absolutely on purpose. They were pulled before that could be done. But if those people have traces of sarin, and I believe you can, I mean, sarin does deteriorate. But I, I read somewhere. I mean, I may be wrong. I'm not a scientist, but I, I believe that you know you can find. Uh, residue is not of sarin itself, but you know things that it changes in a body. If it's found that they did die from sarin poisoning, then given that there was no sarin in the area, that will conclusively prove all the things we've been saying on this program about how it was staged, and uh, not just on this program, of course, but in earlier programs and in articles that we've been writing. But it, you know, it would then become impossible to deny. Uh, that that was the case. Yeah, I think at this moment in time, it's pretty much impossible to deny. That I think it's a hoax that the OPCW is corrupted beyond repair. 
Well, indeed, sir. Well, actually, and that was another thing, a lot of the people at this meeting were expressing great concern about the OPCW. And Major Major General Holmes, who, as I said, as I said has been, uh, 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 who's a British soldier who's fought in the field and commanded troops in combat. I mean, one of the points that he made was that chemical weapons are these incredibly dangerous weapons, and we need the Chemical Weapons Convention to work properly, and we need a proper organization like the OPCW to police it. Now, I should say those comments were made not in the meeting itself, but you know, on its sort of outskirts. But I don't think I'm misrepresenting what he said. In fact, I'm saying saying it exactly as he said it. All right, Alexander McCurr, editor in chief of the Durant. Thank you very much, guys. If you like this video, click on the subscribe button down below. Click on that notifications bell. Smash that like. Please donate to us on PayPal, Patreon, and subscribe star. And check out this video on BitChute.com. We post all our videos on BitChute, so look for us there as well. And look for us on the Duran shop. Pick up some magic mugs. Pick up some shirts. It really helps out this channel. It certainly does. Now you know we 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 go out so so many times on a limb to cover programs like this. And we depend very much on the support of our viewers to do this. And we, Alex has talked about, you know, the problems that we have on previous occasions getting out stories. So it, it's 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 important to us that we do get your support. And one of the ways you can support us is by helping us through our shop. But having said that, you know, we do have good things in our shop. We're not asking you to buy, you know, any old rubbish. We're asking you to buy are really fantastic and fine things like our famous magic mugs you can see this there and um, we've made a point we, we just as we try to do really quality analysis and reporting we set out to do very high products on our shop in our merchandise and you can our, our, our mugs for example which we've talked about often are of the highest standard we uh, we you know, Alex found a really top quality supplier. Um, they're beautifully made. They're incredibly light and strong. They don't crack or chip. They don't discolor. I've had this mug now, which is the Duran mug, with our own double-headed eagle for for around a year, and you'll see that it's in perfect shape. So they're about the best mugs you can find. And the same applies to all our other products, to our shirts like the Duran polo shirt that I'm wearing now, which also has our double-headed eagle lo logo there. But you can also find our short sleeve t-shirts, our long sleeve t-shirts. You can also find hats, hoodies, stickers, all these things. So you are helping the Duran by coming to our shop and buying these things. And if you do, you're also owning some really fine and good things. We make a point to make sure that they're of high quality. So please come to our shop support us in that way be the proud owner of these great things and alex will show you how just go to the duranshop.com you'll find a link in the description box down below alexander mccurse editor-in-chief of the duran thank you very much until next time everybody take care